Hello everyone and welcome to a very special Reach Insights interview. Uh, today we are in the beautiful gardens in Devon and we're talking to a Reach legend really. He's the longest serving ambassador, he's Frank Letch. Frank, thank you so much for inviting us into your beautiful garden. Thank you and thank you for bringing the weather with you, I presume. Uh, well, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. If only you could see the view we've got over Crediton in Devon, it's absolutely stunning. It is. But we're here to continue the, the series, mm. and you are a bit of a reach legend. You've been, you've served in many different roles. Just give us a, a quick overview of your involvement with reach. Um, it started when I went to Wrexham Hospital in 1992 two to have a prosthesis made for my driving saw this little thing that said reach the children for, uh, association for children with upper lumps and i thought hmm, never heard of it so i wrote immediately to the secretary and said look do you think i could help you at all and um, within three months i was in manchester then in liverpool with branch meetings uh, then i moved up to scotland and decided to attend the annual general meeting which then was a day only in glasgow and they were short of a trustee and i thought do you know, I think I could do this. So I stood up and a lady called Elaine Clark seconded me. So I was the, uh, uh, straight away. And I still remember, bless him, I hope he doesn't hear this, but he will. The, <laughs> the then chairman, Nigel Tarrant, wrote to me and said, what is your agenda for wanting to become a trustee? And I thought, pardon? I have no arms and I have to have an agenda to be a member of your trustee board. Um, and then it went on from there and uh, I've loved every minute I was on. Uh, locally, we started up a branch where I was the coordinator, the treasurer, and uh, it was just one of those things. You got to know so many people. And of course, ma many people will know you. You know, I've been around Reach for mm. maybe seven years, and you just seem to be almost like part of the Reach furniture, as it were. But for people who, of course, just watching maybe for the very first time, don't really know an awful lot about Reach, you know, you, I think it would be fair to say, is, are one of our more senior uh, members yes. and ambassadors. Yeah. Things would have been very different when, when you were growing up than mm. reach children today who have so many resources at their disposal. Yeah. Give us an, an indication of what it was like growing up and, and particularly for your parents when you were very young. In my day the education said you had to go to a special school. The only thing they weren't was special. They were actually carpets under which they swept people with a whole range of disabilities, mental, physical, everything, and it was terrible. And then luckily I got a scholarship to go to a private school, or oh, as we call them in English, public school, because the only thing it isn't is public, <laughs> uh, which I think really helped. And I did get some sort of help there, but as far as having help as a family, absolutely zero. And in fact, the first thing I remember was in 1960, 61, somebody knocked at our door in Stratford. There'd been an article about me in the local paper and they'd had a boy born with no arms from thalidomide. And suddenly you felt so sorry that, you know, that this person had been born this way. And one of the things that my, I never ever felt, and I know my mother never ever felt, was guilty. But you see, the thing about thalidomide is it's known that the mum took the drug and they have to live with that and because Reach didn't really start until 1978 so I'm told I wasn't around with Reach then it was really so much needed and the people who needed it actually and probably still do it's not the children mm. it's the parents the grandparents the uncles the aunties the school teachers all these people who are around in this sort of plethora of people around our reach child. And we're going to talk more about dealing with that and specifically um, about the disability living allowance mm. which is something that I know you a feel very strongly about but also have a huge amount of knowledge in. But just before we get to that mm. let's talk a little bit more um, about growing up because one of the biggest questions I, th I know reach often get from new parents is how am I going to cope? What mm. do I need to do differently yes. to enable my child to be able to succeed in, in the world and just live as a child? And of course when you didn't have any resources to draw upon. Mm. How did your parents deal with things? I think we, we were lucky. They, they very much let me get on with by myself a lot of the time because, as you can understand, I, the first person I met with an upper limb deficiency was at boarding school and he, called, he was called Arthur Cunningham and he had missing f uh, uh, fingers on one hand and he was the first, uh, we think, uh, toe uh, hand transfer. So there was nothing going on. But we were very lucky in that my godmother and godfather lived next door and I'm from a very, very working class London family who really did think that you go your, you make your own, you 
your own furrow, you go your own way. And so in that sense, I wasn't imposed upon very much. And I do think really that parents have to have courage and let the child make the decisions. Because I'm naturally, a I always say, you should set yourself challenges. I know I will never ever climb Everest. So kids, don't set yourself the challenge of Everest. But I can get that Snowden. So set yourself a Snowden. It's not as high as Everest, but my Jove, it's pretty high up. And actually you're a great example of someone who's defied what some would consider tough odds mm. in, in life. You, you've become a mayor of this town, Crediton. Yes. You've been a successful teacher. Mm -hmm. You've done a huge amount. How much is that down to your personal drive? How much was down to your parents? And how much was down to this, I'll show them? I'm going to be very boastful and say it's mostly down to me because the one thing I didn't want to be was a second class me. I knew that I had potential and the thing I needed to do was to develop that which I had. And I, I was very lucky in that I came from a family where everybody, uh, all the children, followed their mums and dads into factories and shops and so on. And I realised I was never going to do that. And going to this public school showed me that, you know, and I went while I was there to France and I fell in love with France. And the reason was, when I went to France speaking my schoolboy French, they didn't look at me uh, upon me as a little boy with no arms. They looked upon me as a little English boy who, blow, he's really trying to speak our language. Oh, and he's got no arms as well. So that was the, skirt, the scale, if you like. And that's the thing I've always taken. I love France, I love the French, and they adore me because I understand their culture, their literature. And, and, and that's the thing, is not to make so much of being without arms. Your message clearly has always been about carving out your own life. And yes. During the series, we've talked to everybody from the arts through to sport and in business. And it's great to hear all of those stories because it just shows people mm. that actually it doesn't have to be limiting at all. It's, it's, as you say, it's down to you as an individual and in, in what you do. I think, in a sense, it channeled me because I knew I would never work in the soap factory. So, and, and then you think, so, so what can I do? And I, have this, and I do have, I, I'll be boastful and say, I do have a gift for languages. I speak five, well, if you include English, um, four plus English. Um, I even speak Devon, if you want me to, sir. Um, <laughs> proper job. Proper job. <laughs> uh, and, and that was the way. Uh, but it's so easy because what you're doing, the one thing about being a teacher is if the really good teachers, there are two things about them. They love children and they can act. Because if you don't love children, forget it. You may be the best mathematician in the school, and you're certainly going to be a better mathematician than all the children, but if you cannot love them and teach them, go out, leave, find another job. Uh, and that's what I felt about teaching, that I, I do have a gift. I'm like a Pied Piper, and I can tell you an absolute true story. I was out here one day, I hadn't been here very long, and I had 13 children on a Sunday morning helping me gardening, weeding, God, and one of the parents came home and said, Frank, you know, you're mad. I said, why is that? All oh, these children. I said, yeah, two of them are yours, by the way. <laughs> I want to come on to the um, disability living uh -huh. allowance because this is an area where people are asking all the time when we look at the REACH forum. And mm. we will talk a little bit later about how you can get in touch with REACH and how you can yes. really make the most of the forums and the advice mm. and the help that's available. What, at what point should people start even thinking about it, you know, about it as a resource? At what, what stage, you know, for example, as soon as you've had a scan and you found out you're going to have a child with an upper limb difference, at what point should we be looking at it? Disability living allowance is an allowance made to help people with exceptional physical challenges. It is not a reward for having no hands or no arm. And as I say to the parents, remember this, if you're going to put in a claim for disability living allowance, what's the first word? Disability. So you're saying, my child is disabled. And if you are comfortable with that, and the child is comfortable with that, then go ahead. And the sort of things I always ask them to do is, I would start about four or five by comparing, where possible, children peers of my child, A at school, B in the family, what does Auntie Rose do for little Frida because she's got two hands to under, that I, and then what do I do for my little child and how much more is it and is it totally necessary because one of the things you have to say is sometimes parents do actually decide that they need to do too much. 
Well, this is a big, big conversation, I know, within REACH, mm. isn't it? At what point do you let your child work it out for themselves? Yes. At what point do you get, get involved? Yes. And the simple thing that I've, I've found from all of these series of interviews, the single most important thing is having that conversation with the child. Yes. And what's your view on that? I, I think you need to have the conversation with the child, which with, the, with a five-year-old can be quite challenging for them to understand. Uh, and the one thing it shouldn't be thought upon is, oh, I can save that away until they go to university. It, the real purpose of disability living allowance is to give the parents an allowance to help them to buy in extra help, which may be, uh, it, it can of course be physical help. Uh, it just depends the severity of, of the disability uh, the child has. And I always think that the way forward is first of all to involve your specialists at the limb centre if you go to one. And I always encourage people to get in contact with a physiotherapist. Because one of the things, if you've only got one hand that you use all the time, if you're not careful, that side of your body develops rather more than the other side and you need to look at scoliosis which can be a, a really troublesome problem and so that's a sort of help that you need now they may give you exercises to do okay my child is five but they're saying these are the exercises they should do to keep the center of their center of their spine there now that to me is a typical thing that you need disability living allowance for because this is something that you have to do over and above what any other parent has to do with a child with two hands. A lot of people, as soon as you start dealing with government mm. and funding, anything like that, everyone's like, oh, you know, you, you, you almost sink with the thought of paperwork and administration <laughs> and that kind of stuff. You, you get to feel that they make it deliberately difficult, um, exactly. but it's not. I say to parents, the thing you need to do is to answer honestly, because if it gets to the third stage, which I can explain, which is the tribunal, you will be questioned face to face and you need to be able to justify what you've put. When it's just going to the written thing to somebody sat in an office in Bristol, Bath or wherever, then they'll say, don't believe that. And they'll just tick the boxes or put crosses in the boxes. So, so that's very important. The other thing you also need is as much professional help and insight as possible. I've already said the prosthetist, the, the, prosthetist, the physiotherapist, the school. Now, what help does the school have to give to this child in order for it to perform at peer level. And that's the important thing. We want them to perform at peer level. So it may be that even drawing a line with a ruler, if you've only got one hand, is very difficult. So they may need help to do that legitimately. And that's the point. It has to be reasonable and required. You talked there about the stages. Let's talk through that, the, mm. the, the, the process from the moment you've realised yep. by the way that you've mentioned yes. that you're going to need help yes. and that you're actually justified in requesting that help. Talk us through briefly that process from beginning right through to getting some payments. Well, what I would consider any REACH parent is if you're thinking of going through the route of, of uh, disability living now, is contact REACH because we have lots of help out there. The next thing is look at the form carefully and think, right, what external forces can I bring upon this? As I've said, the physiotherapist, the school, the consultant, um, people of that sort. And then answer it as concisely but accurately as possible. And then await the response because you will get a letter saying yay or nay. And if it says nay, you can then say, and it'll give you reasons why they, they've turned you down. Then you need to come back to REACH and say, look, I've been turned down for these reasons. And we will be able to guide you and say, look, you really need to get other information maybe, uh, in other words, to improve, improve your application. Because it, it is a growing application. It's not just there and it's, that's finished. So then it goes to a second adjudicator, again, in an office in Bristol, Bradford or wherever. And they may say, yay, or they may, say nay. they may say yay, but at a rate that you think that's too low, in which case you say, right, and they come back to reach and say, look, the devils have knocked me back again. And these are their reasons, and we'll look at it. And then we'll say, look, we think you should be going to tribunal. And if you want a representative to go with you, then 
hopefully we can go with you. I've represented three or four people. In so that, that's going to be a huge comfort for, for people because hopefully. some people feel that, a, that the whole thing might become too emotional. Yes. They might not feel articulate enough to deal right. in that in what is, can be seen as quite an intimidating environment. Yes. So knowing you've got someone who can potentially help you and be there yes. with you is a huge thing. The, uh, I, I'm, I'm one of those sort of people I, I represent. And one of the things I tell them is I was a judge. I was one of the tribunal panel members. And our role is not to knock you down and say, no, you can't have anything. It's to help you to get a disability living allowance. We're really on your side. And the Department of Work and Pensions are supposed to send somebody to put their arguments. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, they rarely do. So it's not quite like Dragon's Den then? It is nothing like <laughs> Dragon's Den. I mean, if you th um, I don't suffer fools gladly. If I think somebody's trying to pull the wool over their eyes, I will, um, I will say so. For instance, the woman who said she had no idea of time was lost in a fog and then suddenly said to her, uh, you better go because our ticket's time is up. I said, excuse me, but didn't you just say you had no idea of time? <laughs> and she was furious. She let herself into her own trap. But that's the sort of thing you do. But we're, we're there to help. We've, we've, we've talked a lot about the different stages of the tribunal mm -hmm. and, and everything else. And when it comes to advocacy in tribunals, give us an idea of you being an advocate. What I do is I ask the parents to send me all the paperwork. I read through and I see my line of attack, if you like. And then I get back to them and we talk it through on the phone. I say, look, this is what we should we should concentrate on. These are the questions they're likely to ask you because I know the sort of questions the panel members will be asking because I was a panel member. And then I say to them, look, if you are willing, I will come over and I will attend the tribunal with you because, bless them, REACH will fund my expenses because they realise that this is a facility that is really desperately needed to help you. And what about things changing as the child gets older and needs change and so on? How often do you have to go back and have that readjusted? You, what you'll get, you'll get an award for a rate and a time. So you may get low, middle rate from till, till they're 11. Then at 11 you have to reapply. And the reasons being they think by the age of 11 you may have been able to uh, get round some of the challenges you had as a six and seven year old. Uh, you may then you may find that's repeated, that you get the same award, middle, lower, whatever, until 16. And it will stop at 16 because then it transferred to PIP, personal independence payments, um, which have different criteria. So you will then have to make another application. But normally it's the, ch the, the child, the child, the, 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 yeah, the reach child themselves who make that with the help of mum, dad, specialists and so on. And REACH of course. Because, and REACH will be there. And especially when you look at youngsters going through university, yes. you know, there's, there's, there's needs going to be all the way through their lives. If you, I, was, I applied to go to uh, Exeter University to read a, a fast-track uh, fast law degree. I was accepted. And there, because they knew me, they said, look, we actually have a disabilities officer. So they're there in the universities. But you need to know it. It's no good having a facility and keeping it in a, in a little room that nobody knows about. Uh, and really, you need to poke and prod to find out what is out But again, there. the great thing about REACH is the resources page yes. there, the fact that there are so many people who've been, been through, through this it. already. Absolutely. I mean, back in 95, mm. there weren't so many people, but no. now, no. you know, 26 years later. Well, I'm REACH member 442. <laughs> <laughs> and it had been going since 1978. So from 1978 to 1992, there had been 441 members. Now, I, they, the, the ladies in the office will be able to tell you, it's probably near a 3,000. So that's the way we've grown, um, which is important and impressive. And still quite a lot of us uh, are still around. I mean, yes, I am the, the granddad, if you like, of them all. Um, but my mother's 101 and still going. Not that I'm guaranteeing to be around till I'm 101, but I think you've got me as, as an active, and that's the important thing, I am active, an active REACH ambassador for at least the next 10 years. Well, I'm sure that's very good news to everybody. <laughs> and uh, I can see out the corner of my eye, we do have uh, one or two people from the office who uh, seem to be um, putting big thumbs up to that. All oh, right. Now, the, 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 the weekends and, and so on, 
obviously they had to go on virtual yeah. last year but in, again a very important part of the whole reach program and, and i've seen you there every single reach weekend that i've been there how important is the support that reach can give to families to youth i, I think it can give a lot of support to both sections of the family and if you see me at reach meetings the kids flock to me because they, ah look there's the guy with no and i am known you see i always say in town when i'm canvassing i say it's no good you know i go down with this mask on because of covid but people still recognize <laughs> me to, normally to ask difficult questions and of course the locals laugh at that but that's the but then the parents know because because i have this experience and they will always come up and say look what do you think about one of the great things is should we be wearing, should we be pushing a prosthesis? And I say, ask the child. What does the child think? I got rid of my prosthesis, which I wore from the age of six, and when I was 19. And I didn't wear it for Frank Letch Jr. I read it for Frank Letch Sr., my father, my mother, the school. I wore it for other people to fill the useless sleep. It did nothing. The only things it enabled me to do was to undo my zip to go for a pee and to eat. Once I'd, su I'd sussed how to do both those things, I thought, what do I need it for? So the first thing is I couldn't put it on myself. And this was, I always tell parents, you, with all these things, what is the gain and what is the loss? If they've lost independence because they need to have a prosthesis put on, is it worth it? And, and it's a big debate every Absolutely. single reach weekend. It is. And, and it is something where people will have very personal views on yes. it and they will also have very individual views yes, on, on, on the way they see it. And, and I, I think most people would agree. It's again coming back to that conversation. I want to talk a little bit about your life and how you've got to where you are. You've had reach in the background for mm -hmm. the last you know, 26 years or so. And mm. um, for you, being able to achieve what you've been able to achieve, what would you say to other youngsters? Because we, we've had people who mm. are interested in sport. Mm. I'm a great believer in every child is going to be good at something. Yeah. So in your world of public service, what would you say to a child who's considering public service and has an upper limb difference? With COVID, don't bother. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think if you have this sort of burning urge to help your community, then you start by looking online at minutes, at meetings, because one of the wonderful things about IT, when I started out being a counsellor, it was all paper and people. Now it's still people, but you can see so much of it streamed online. And it gives, and it gives you an idea of, you know, ah, so that's what they, the other thing I w would also suggest is have a chat to a counsellor. Go up to them, you know, what is it you guys and girls do that's so important? And find out, uh, because, they will discover that there are certain areas of our community where we can have a positive input. And that, I think, is important. And the other thing is that councillors are the voice of the people who put them in. So do you want to be the voice to a group? Well, come on then. If you do, you've got to get off your seat and you've got to start moving. You've got to start working at it. And it gives a huge amount of confidence to every individual knowing that that's available to them. It, and, and we yeah. should actually mention that as well, because, you know, there'll be youngsters who are thinking about driving. And we, we, yes. we, we've done quite a few programmes yes. on driving and things. Yes. And of course, you know, you've got your car down there yes. adapted. And th th there's, you seem to be one of those people who, do, who doesn't let limitations get in your way. The other thing I don't do is I don't get overcomplicated. If you saw my car, you think, well, where does he drive that then? All there is is a thing on the steering wheel. Uh, in fact, if ever I park up anywhere and get out, you'll immediately see four or five people going, God, God, did he really drive that car with no arms? We'll have to go over Ethel and have a look. And they do. It's hilarious. It's hilarious. Uh, it is very, very simple. So, um, so, so that, I think, is, is very important. But the, there, there are lots of other things that I think we need to make life simple for, for our students. We are there, um, and I am there as a role model. All I say is, I give you the option. I'm not saying living without an artificial arm is right, wrong or right. I can say, uh, all I say is, look, this is how, how I do it, and you might like to think about it yourself. And parents, you might like to think about it, because parents often get very embarrassed, you know, when, when children go out and they think, mm, you know, people are looking at me. Now, if people don't look at me, I think there's something wrong with their eyesight. And that's a really interesting one that comes up every single time. And I've asked every single interviewee about 
how their mechanism for dealing with the questions, to deal with the looks, and also how their parents dealt with it, because it's something that's really quite often at the forefront of people's minds. Yes, I, I think because I was at boarding school for years and we didn't go out many places, my parents weren't often challenged by people because we were very much in the family. Uh, as a person going out there, I'm very vi physical, I'm very visible, very high profile, and I have been ever since I was at university. Um, and I never worry about people asking me, and if they ask me, they'll get the right answers. Kids will come up and say, Frank, because they all know me by my first name. I go into school and say, here we have the mayor. Anybody got Frank? And the kids, uh, and they'll, they'll come up to me like five and six. Years. Why haven't you got any arms? I said, well, darling, we don't know why. But just when I was born, I was born like this, only a lot smaller. Because you've got to become, and they laugh and I say, but of course, although I've got no arms, I have got hands. <laughs> what? Yeah, I've got hands. Where are they then? Yeah. <laughs> so they say, well, what can you do? Oh, would you like me to? So I'll, I'll sit down and write for them. I'll do little things that I can on the street. And it just relieves all the tension. And sometimes if I'm out, kids will say something to the parents. Shh. I say, please, do not ever tell your child to shush when it wants to ask a question, because I will give the answer. And they say, are you sure? Absolutely sure. Now you've become a legend not just in credit and not just in reach but actually on tv four documentaries about you uh, three and, and one nearly nearly finished yes I'm, and, I'm and, and we have to leave fairly soon because he's got another film crew coming in <laughs> in a moment yes this such is as the demand that Stephen you're Morgan and co. <laughs> yeah it, it, it all started because i was a welsh learner and was on tv and uh, the a very famous Gwynerville said you know i think we could make a documentary and we made one in welsh and it represented um, S4, uh, then it was HTV in a competition, which it won and became the best British documentary. It then, bless it, had to represent Great Britain in the International Documentary of the Year, which was held in New Delhi. Sadly, HTV couldn't afford to send me to New Delhi. I have re real regrets on that one. And it won. And it was the first ever minority language documentary to win that international award. Well, congratulations on that. And uh, clearly, you did something right. The fact they keep coming back. Yes, fourth <laughs> time, yes. But again, it's because, and this is the nice thing, the reason they want to speak to me is not because I've got no arms, it's because I speak Welsh. I understand Welsh. And I'm a sort of a Welsh ambassador as well. And that to them is very important. Now, Frank, you said that you are aiming to serve Reach for at least another 10 years, mm -hmm. but you've already got many legacies in place. And one of them, of course, was starting the Reach Activity Week, or known as RAW. Mm. Uh, how, uh, first of all, what made you come up with that idea? How have you seen it evolve? And what would you like it to become? It started because in 1999, the, the then coordinator, Stu, Stu Stokes and I, and a couple of the uh, other helpers, we went to Budapest to attend the, um, it was a sort of outward bound center in Budapest for a week. I was so impressed with the whole setup. I thought, Reach can do this. So I came back and I was a trustee and I saw Jeremy Beadle. I said, Jeremy, I've seen this idea of having a REACH activity week and Sue has found somewhere where we can go. We've got rough costings, but I said, it's not cheap. Let's fundraise. Now, Jeremy was a wonderful fundraiser and he put on these Beatles night and we, we raised, and like, so the, the children did pay, but they didn't pay what the cost really was. And um, James, who is our cameraman, was, one of, was at the first REACH and attended many. Having worked so hard to get that first weekend up and running, give us an idea of what it was like, and yours must have had a tremendous sense of achievement. It was wonderful. The first one had 40 reach children and 10 children from Hungary. And I, I think the lasting memory I have of that first one, and it almost brought tears to my eyes, was I was sat by the telephone booth, and I heard this little girl, like Helen, Helen Love, and she said, Mummy, guess what? I've just learned how to tie my shoelaces with one hand. And to me, that even now, I get emotional about that because our then um, helpers, who all themselves had to have a missing, an upper limb deficiency, said, no child leaves this raw without being able to tie their shoelaces. And that's what they did. You know, they, get, they got on at them, on at them. And I thought, you know, that's a small challenge. It's a small step, but it's a step in the right direction. And massively significant for most children. Absolutely. That independence, they can do it themselves. Yeah. 
Finally, I want to talk about the other area of your life incredibly important to you is, is reach. You know, I, I see the passion with which you, you know, you come to all the events, mm. the fact that you go to tribunals, the fact that you are so supportive of people. For somebody who's just discovering reach, can you somehow encapsulate what reach means to you and how they can get the best out of reach? I think what REACH means to me is probably the opposite to what it means to them because I see REACH as a challenge and I am a resource that they can use and I would encourage every member of REACH, particularly the new people, to explore the website, to explore Deb's, Kate or and if they've got one, their local branch because it's only by mis mixing with other people that you will then pick up the little hints and little, uh, the ways people interact with each other, the way the children interact with each other. Uh, and REACH really is, has to me always been a wonderful family. And we talk about the family weekend. Unfortunately, we can't get all 3,000 families together. It would be lovely if we could. But really, I think with live streaming, we are getting there. And I think that is the way forward. It's a way of getting out there to so many people, not just REACH members, but you know, they should be telling other people, hey, because they'll be, the neighbours will be interested in this little boy or girl with no hands. Would you like to see what goes on in our association? Look, you just go on this, this facility and they'll be amazed. Frank, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much indeed for joining us today and for inviting us into your garden, but also to share your life and to have given such a legacy uh, to Reach. And hopefully you'll be around a lot longer than 10 years, maybe like your mother, 101. Do my best. Frank, thank you so much indeed. And thank you very much indeed for joining us as well. We'll be back for our very final episode next week. We'll be talking to Cornell Hariska Munn, who is an extraordinary individual, as you will find out next week. In the meantime, don't forget to go onto the REACH website, have a look at all the resource pages and become immersed in the amazing family that is REACH. In the meantime, thanks again. Bye for now.